All right, and we to hear from uh, Peter Piera Jack as far as South Sudan is concerned of, with these new revelations, uh, the resumption or, or even more sanctions. And of course, this also is targeted to some of the leaders. Uh, the resolution approved by a nine to uh, nil vote with six abstentions uh, was also was a watered down version of a draft measure proposed by United States, whose ambassador Nick Haley also uh, wrote in the Washington Post on Wednesday that administration had lost patience with the status quo in South Sudan. Uh, what we need now is concrete action by the full international community to hold these warring parties accountable, Haley said in impassioned remarks uh, before the vote. She called the resolution a modest step that will extend sanctions for 45 days and demand a cessation of hostilities. And we'll read more, and of course, uh, of this in other bulletins as far as the securities are concerned, also, or, or journals. But we want to hear from, from you. Uh, some of the leaders, I think, is it nine of them or seven? Six. Six of them. Yeah. Uh, yes, and you can just give us their names as well. And these sanctions, mm. we saw there was an ease, but now they actually stand. Will it also be the prime solution as far as, uh, you know, seeking peace in South Sudan is concerned? Well, first of all, uh, Debal, let me say that uh, it has been, it's taken so long with the international community threatening actions. Every time you hear, they say that if you don't sign peace, if there is no progress, then we are going to take actions. And then the kind of actions that have been taken so far have been quite inadequate. Uh, they're not the kind that are actually pressuring the leaders to stop the war. Uh, some of the measures that are being proposed, being proposed them have even been imposed. Uh, there are a number of generals in South Sudan and political leaders that have been sanctioned. Uh, the, their name is in uh, uh, part of this UN uh, sanctions. Uh, the new list that, they, 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 that is being proposed uh, is adding six additional names to a name that are already there. Uh, some of the names that are being added, uh, the people had been already san sanctioned by the US and by the EU, but not by the UN. So if you look People like Paul Malone, mm -hmm. you know, he was sanctioned in the last round uh, uh, by the U.S. and by the European Union. But uh, when the U.S. last year or two years ago tried to introduce a resolution to put sanction of him, it didn't, it didn't pass. So he's on the list. Uh, there is another gentleman called Malek Rubin. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a lieutenant general. He's no longer in the military. He was removed a few months ago. He's no longer there. Uh, so if you look at these guys, first of all, Paul Malone is not even in the government anymore. So he's somebody that has rebelled, has declared his own rebellion, is here in Juba. Uh, the other gentleman is no longer in the military. Then if you look at the rest of the people, you have the Minister of Information, mm -hmm. Michael McQuay. Uh, you have the Minister of Defense, uh, Kual Manyang. You have Minister of Cabinet Affairs, uh, Martin Ilia. And then you have one person from the rebellion, uh, somebody called uh, Chual Rambang. If you look uh, at these people that are being uh, put on the list, the other two, you can say Martin and Michael McQuay has been more uh, uh, spoken out about the sit situation back home and mm -hmm. being very defensive of the government position, which sort of like uh, made these measures to be, uh, uh, to, to be introduced. My worry, Dibal, is uh, if you look at some of the measures that are being uh, introduced as a result of the ceasefire being violated, uh, what, what, what really surprised me is when you look at how South Sudan worked, the defense minister doesn't really command the military. And no minister really from the government command the military. It's the military leadership. You look at the security side, you look at the army side, and there are no sanctions uh, on these guards. So there is a concern there. But for me, what really will matter is whether these sanctions, if imposed, can actually be implemented, right? Uh, because as I mentioned to you before, there are a number of generals back home. Mm -hmm. They have been sanctioned by the UN, but they are moving all over the region. They're living in the region. Mm -hmm. So the, you, 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 you don't see that uh, there is a real impact. Now, what might be very encouraging is this arm embargo, because it makes little sense for us to be buying a lot of weapons when we are only using them to kill ourselves. Mm -hmm. but, but it remains to be seen if region will have the will to implement them. Because in this resolution, one of the countries that is sitting in the UN Security Council is Ethiopia. And if you look at how Ethiopia voted, Ethiopia didn't vote for the resolution. Yes. Ethiopia abstained, and abstained up to, and even you talk about how the, ver how the draft was watered down. Mm -hmm. It was watered down mainly because of countries like Ethiopia, so that they can abstain instead of like voting no, right? 
So what does that tell you? Will they be able to implement these sanctions? Will they be able to implement the arm embargo? Will they be able to imp uh, implement the, uh, the freezes of assets? There are all sort of assets that is here in the region, in Kenya in particular, uh, and in U Uganda. But if there is any indication whatsoever that uh, some of these regional countries will take this action, this is the question that remains to be seen. Uh, in my view, it's very encouraging that the UN Security Council, at the very least, is acting uh, on uh, the promises that it has been making. My concern is, are they really targeting the right people? We know in mm. South Sudan who is preventing peace. We know the people. We know the people that have control about the president. Right. We, we, we know the people that control the military, that control the dynamics in the country. And those names are missing on the list. So you, you go and put uh, some of these other guys that are, are politicians. Yes, you can punish them for not using their political weight to pressure uh, things in the country. But mm. the guys that are in direct command, that are making decisions, those guys are not being held accountable. And they are not anywhere in the list. And then again, even if they were in the list, can this sanction be implemented? This is the question that really remains. Right. And so maybe we can, uh, we can run. I think you've given us a few names. But we have, uh, of course, you've mentioned Paul Malong. Yeah. And then we have the Minister of Information, Michael uh, Leuth. McQuay, McQuay Leuth. Uh, yeah, McQuay, uh, you've mentioned him. Yes. Also Deputy Chief of uh, Defense for Logistics in South Sudan Army. That is Malek Ruben, also Riak uh, yeah. Rengu. Yeah. Uh, Kwan Rambang, yeah. the Governor of Beeth State, uh, who also the United States accused of leading military attacks and uh, obstructing aid to civilians. And the Cabinet uh, Affairs Minister, that is Martin Elia Lomuro. Yeah. So all these are politicians, and you said uh, these guys that we have on this list, they shouldn't first, uh, in the first place be in this particular list. There are some guys who are missing who actually should be in this list. Yes. So th there, are, there, are, there are some right people there, right? So you talk about like, uh, so for example, Michael, uh, Michael McQuay and Martin Elia are, the main, are part of the main top leadership of the government team in the negotiations, mm -hmm. right? So they represent the voice of the president, right? And this is sometimes very important to see. Are they speaking in their own voices? Or are they speaking on the voice of somebody else? Right? That is, a, that is one issue. Uh, so these guys, Michael McQuay and, uh, and, 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 and Martin Elia, as yes. I mentioned to you, mm -hmm. Michael McQuay is the face of the government. He's the one, is the spokesperson of the government. He's speaking there. And of course, those of us, uh, South Sudanese population, feel that the government is sometimes not being serious. So, of course, most of that blame goes directly to him. But the question you raise then is, but who is making me speak that way, right? This is the, the point that I'm raising, right? It, it, it's not so much about what is he saying, but is he saying what he's saying as a result of what, right? The same thing even with Martin. Martin is the head of the cabinet, so it's sort of like, it, it's, you don't have this position in Kenyan cabinet, mm -hmm. but it's sort of like a prime minister. is the one that is in charge of supervising uh, the entire operation of the government. It is the cabinet affairs minister. And most of the time, he speaks uh, his mind, he speaks for the president, he's very uh, radical uh, to a certain extent. So you can you, argue you, you, you that there is a sense to, to, to push him, to, to push If you look, what is actually his influence on the president in terms of like the military operations? Mm -hmm. And if you look in reality, it's really not there. The guys that are actually having the influence are not on the list. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, the guys that are making the list, they know these guys. Sometimes maybe the idea is to negotiate with some of these guys so that some of this harmful behavior uh, changes, so that these guys become uh, more constructive in how they behave. Uh, that maybe could be the intention. But again, as I mentioned to you, this is not the first round of sanctions. Previous rounds have been, mm -hmm. have been imposed. But up to now, no single implementation. These guys are moving around. And as you will see in, 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 in the, the UN Security Council document, these guys have many passports. They have, they've got Kenyan passport, they've got Uga Ugandan passport, they've got Ethiopian passport. Some of them even have British passports. Right? Oh, really? So how are you going to really, if, if I'm coming to Kenya on a Kenyan passport, are you going to prevent me to enter a Jomo Kenyatta airport? Because you will not board. You will not board. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also we have uh, 
the ambassador, the, the Ethiopian ambassador to, I think, the United Nations, that uh, is uh, Takada Alemo, is saying, yes, we, they understand the frustration of the U.S., but they will not really support this. And then he says this particular statement, uh, which he quote, at a time when IGAD is at a very critical moment, the adoption of a draft resolution table before us will be detrimental to the process. It is a very, very tragic development indeed. This is what he says. And of course we know uh, they didn't have a happy medium uh, uh, last week when we had the IGAD resolution, uh, I mean the IGAD uh, summit. They didn't come up with a prime solution on this. How will it also really affect the entire process of uh, the, the IGAD summit and what they really came up with? Because there was none in the first place. Duval, as I mentioned to you last week, IGAD has been dragging its, its feet. All the countries in IGAD are one way or another benefiting from the war. And then holding on to this peace file, that this peace mediation that IGAD has been doing is lucrative for them. They're making a ton of money. So they don't want this process even to end. When you talk to IGAD behind closed doors, they tell you, yeah, it's, it's really up to you guys to end this war. You know, if you want to end it, you can end it. What are we? We are, we are just here. You know, we can't come and tell you to stop fighting. They tell you this behind the scenes. But then when you say you can take the kind of actions that will make our people choose peace mm -hmm. or a peaceful way of resolving the crisis. For example, arm embargo, right? Mm -hmm. I keep talking a lot about arm, arm embargo because uh, in, 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 in this panel we talk about security and defense. And for me in Africa, I like to imagine an Africa where we will not be fighting one another. That South Sudan uh, does not look at security being threatened by Kenya or any of its neighbors. Where I think, and, you, and that is true, by the way, if you look, most of the conflict inside Africa are within the state. It's true. These are not states that are, it's, it's not really one state versus another, it's within the state. So the whole idea of building up mil, uh, huge armies, this is not to protect anybody within in your country, it's essentially to, 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 to fight, to suppress your people. Mm -hmm. So there should be arm embargo. What we should be focusing is internal security. They so that arm, arm embargo makes sense if it will be implemented. We wonder whether it will be implemented, but that's the kind of stuff that we need to do. The region has not been serious, and they engage in blame games with the U.S. because I think what the U.S. is doing is pushing the region that if you are unable to solve this problem, then hand the file to the African Union, and the region doesn't want to do that, right? Or hand the file to the U.N., or somebody that can do it, because AU has more political teeth. Right. And it can pressure the member state to at least not interfere as much as IGAD has been unable to do. Right. Let's hear from uh, Rasa Zumancha. Why haven't you borne enough pressure also yeah, on, on, on South Sudan? And uh, in, in terms of the IGAD and that particular summit, uh, that they didn't have any prime solution uh, coming from that particular summit, what he says that behind the scenes they speak you know, uh, very differently from the optics that we have when they're actually on the summit. First of all, is it true? that uh, you know that, first of all, that in South Sudan, this war cannot end. Somewhat you're actually caught in a pickle uh, as AU, but when it comes to summit and uh, press conferences, you give a different picture. So you're speaking from, you know, both sides of the mouth. Correct. Yes, Dipa, I agree with Peter. That really the big challenge for the peace in South Sudan is the region that has not been able to speak with one another. <laughs> from the same script mm -hmm. and and that paralysis is what has also caused Igad not to make progress because uh, I, I you know if you look at even the negotiation structure itself uh, the people negotiating and the, the parties that come to the negotiating table and uh, you know the elements that are there I should also by perhaps mention Sudan itself Th there are some conflict of interest uh, in terms of approaches to the peace process and therefore mm. I, I would submit that this file should have been transferred long time ago. However, the current development is that I know now that there is a deadline that has been set that these negotiations must end by October. Yes. Secondly, in the margins of the AU summit in Workshot, there is going to be a meeting between Salva Kiel and Riek Mashar. Mm -hmm. Let's hope that that will produce something. And of course, as you know, uh, Rai Rodinga has also been involved. He's been able to meet already with uh, Salva Kiel. He's due to meet with uh, Riak Mashal, and hope he will travel to New York short. And that that process 
will produce some momentum to move forward. But coming back to the UN sanctions, you know I proposed some radical uh, solutions here last uh, two weeks ago, and Peter was not amused when I said it is time that this file was with the UN and the UN does message, major surgery of the process. I mean, if you look at, and this is documented, the disagreement between the two protagonists goes back to when they were in the bush, uh, when they were under garang, And there is so much suspicion, there is so much under the pressure that keeping those two parties moving forward, I'm not sure we're going to produce a result. To me, if there was a compromise to safeguard their post participation in the process, give them some retirement package, remove them, have new parties, the young people like Peter, then the country can emerge. Otherwise, it's going to be merry-go-round. You produce a result, you form a government of national unity, mm -hmm. they break up again, and the circle begins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are caught up in this warp of a vicious mm -hmm. circle. Let's hear from mm -hmm. Professor Naomi Damba. Duval, there was once uh, upon a uh, uh, mountain of Maryland, Camp David, um, two antagonists. One was Anwar Sadat and the other one was Menachem Begin. And they have stayed there for quite a while, refusing to talk to each other. On the mountain? Okay. Then they went on a walk. These two people went on a walk and they came closer to each other. And Menachem Begin look at Sadat directly and say, Jewish people will never bend their legs on, for you. And then what Sadat said on the other hand, if you and I don't accept peace, then our children and our grandchildren will continue butchering each other. For how long? And I know I will not live. Mm -hmm. And these two gentlemen came together and settled peace and got Nobel Prize Award. It is time Salva Kiir and Rick Machar be locked into one room with perhaps Ray Lodinga for one week. And they come out hugging each other for the sake of South Sudan. So the hug. Of course, we saw the ripple effect also in Uganda. Uh, BCJ hugging <laughs> with Museveni yeah. as well. So, but if uh, I may interject here, uh, okay. much as uh, that Menachem Begin and uh, Israel Anwar Sadat uh, signed that peace, but as peace returned there, it was good on paper, but the, 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 the process has remained. I mean, Israel is now actually thrown all that out of the window, ambassador. and even the solution of two-state solution is dying. It's dying as Amb well. Yeah. Ambassador, the yeah. Israelis and the Egyptians are no longer fighting on the desert. That's true. All Just right. For the, that's those true. two yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. countries, Egypt and, and Israel, they don't um, and it worked for them. But as Ambassador is saying, in mm. fact, uh, now we have a country here that is running riot and, and killing innocent people, I mean effectively mm. terrorizing Palestinians. Uh, 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 in the Gaza. Now, for these two people, and, and the, I, I want to, uh, uh, the, 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 Salva Kiir and who else? Yes. Riek Machar. They should be given uh, a 30 day ultimatum, in my view, yeah. that they, they meet, hug, handshake, and agree to silence their weapons. 30 days, by the way, and not, not anything more than that. Or they should, if they don't, then they are plucked out in the same manner that Bagbo was plucked out of uh, uh, um, Cote d'Ivoire. And, and if, if, if they're given more time, as Ambassador is saying, these are people who actually now, the differences between those two are irreconcilable. Mm -hmm. They cannot agree. And so they must be forced to agree. Now, they cannot continue to rule on the back of dying children, dying women, uh, starving uh, 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 South Sudanese. And the second point here, Dibali, is the, is the competing interest among the neighboring countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and Sudan. Sudan. This is something that has got to be addressed. And these countries have got to come to the table and agree that they cannot continue 
punishing South Sudan because of their competing interest in the manner that this is a country that we all uh, uh, celebrated when it gained independence and look at where it is today it's it's shameful it is embarrassing for Africans that South Sudanese are fighting one another after fighting for over 50 years 50 years for independence and this is what is happening something has got to be done and I want to appeal to uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta uh, Ahmed Abir of uh, uh, Ethiopia, Kaguta Museveni of uh, Uganda, and uh, Omar el-Bashir of Sudan, that they have to provide leadership on the issue of South Sudan. That we must see that South Sudan is going to be peaceful and is going to be good for all of us, not just the South Sudanese, but all of us. South Sudan is not short of leaders. There are many leaders who can take up that country and lead it to where it's supposed to be not where the two, Salva Kiir and uh, Riek Machar, have taken that country. Right. To. Maybe the issue of profiteering uh, uh, from the war also can come to bear when you're discussing, because, the, yes, people want to have that particular war uh, protracted so that they may benefit from it. There are reports that we had uh, uh, before. And uh, we can also weigh in this. Uh, uh, as much as we're talking about South Sudan and the peace, there are people who have vested interest, and, uh, of course, they want the illegal arms to always be circulating in South Sudan. Let's hear from, from you, Lucy. Well, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, what is called the um, mighty military complex is something that is always very represented in any situation where there is a war. Because, and it is ugly, and it is, you know, nothing to look at. But the truth is that there are people who instigate instability for profit. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people don't like looking at that, but you have to look at it in order to understand it, you know? And it, it, so you're caught up here at the bottom, trying to get the people who are disagreeing to agree, mm -hmm. but you are ignoring the people who are actually pouring, you know, um, paraffin mm -hmm. to that particular fire. Because once the paraffin ceases, the fire goes off, and the people are left with no choice but to agree. You'll be very surprised to know that, you know, the people who are fighting this war, they are just tired. They wish they could have a way out, mm -hmm. you know. So being able to address the enabling um, en environment and circumstances that are perpetuating this war, we, we have to look at it. You know, it's like what we were saying earlier, um, and I said during the break, that even as we understand even the insecurity in our schools, even with this small uh, girls issue, I want to know who that man was. I want to understand how he got to where he got to, because then it will help me to know what factors to address to ensure that these things stop happening. And it is the same with this issue. Something is ugly, it's not pretty, but we have to look at it and dissect it and understand it, you know, basically do forensics on it to be able to address it um, you know, in a manner that will probably be sustaining. Because, yeah, South Sudan, man, me, my heart breaks for South Sudan. I feel so pissed. All <laughs> right, Peter. Peter will come to you. Yes. Well, you see, uh, I do agree with the gentlemen that are suggesting that the regional leaders, uh, if they were to agree, can, can fix this problem very easily. Because South Sudan is a landlocked country, uh, and we don't really produce anything. Everything that we, most of the products that we have come from outside. And without our neighbors, we can get access to all of these resources. But when you talk with EGAT, uh, even uh, whether behind the scene or even in public, uh, and you raise this issue of profiteering from the conflict, because there's a lot of evidence that is growing about who kind of businesses that are, uh, are profiting from the war in South Sudan. They tell you it was your fighting in the first place that got us to profit from your war. That's true. So if you, if you are tired of that, you can stop fighting. So, the point that I'm saying is you are not going to see the kind of uh, neighborly leadership from these neighbors to really come in and help South Sudan. They will only do it uh, as long as they're also getting something from it. So I think, and, and, and the, the approach now is that peace agreement that I talked about uh, two weeks ago when we were here, uh, power, uh, power sharing, basically dividing up the cake between all of these parties. And what is unique with this time, there are more than, there are a lot of parties than the last time. And if this is the model that you go through, and this is the, the only proposal they have now on the table, and with all this UN pressure, it seems like this is the proposal that everybody is still talking about. But what will that do? It's exactly as Ambassador Mwencha uh, mentioned. 
it will th th they are now talking about another interim period. I'm very sure before you reach that interim period, all the things that they are saying need to be done, a census mm -hmm. would need to be done. Refugees, which about two million now that are living in neighboring countries, will need to return back home, and then you will need to do elections. Those things are not good. And then you need to, uh, and, and the biggest of them is security sector reform, yeah. integrating all the militia groups into the army, and then having a professional uh, army that can actually guarantee uh, the conduct of fair and free election. Those things are not going to be done, and most likely you're going to have another war break out. So next time, you will have actually way more parties than what you just have now. And that is the kind of peace agreement, in my view, uh, South Sudanese should not accept. Because uh, this war, we should not make it into a war where we encourage people to... South Sudan that does not want to be a minister. And, and of course, anywhere else in the world. So if you make that about killing 10, 15 people, and then you come to a peace talk, and then you get a, 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 a big chunk. Uh, it, it's ridiculous. You have people my age now in South Sudan military that are major generals. Yeah. You know, and it's unacceptable anywhere else in the world. And they have been in the military for two to three, uh, three years as rebels. And then they were integrated. This kind of peace is a very bad peace. And it goes into like reproducing this kind of cycle of violence, which will trap South Sudan for long. And we know very well like countries like Burundi are going through this. Once you have been in violent situation for a very long, at least five years, it's not very easy uh, to escape. So this kind of lazy uh, solution that IGAD is proposing is not going to work. I think what is needed, uh, South Sudanese people, you know, South Sudanese people, these are amazing people, you know. Uh, my people, they're amazing people because it's not easy to accomplish what we accomplished. We fought for generations, made sacrifices so that we can achieve what we achieved. And by the way, when we were doing it, Many, parts of, many people in the world were not standing with us. We started by ourselves. It's only when they realized that we were going to succeed that we now start getting our lives. So I'm appealing again to South Sudanese people. We can fix this. We don't need to be begging Bashir or uh, Uhuru or Abi or Kaguta. We don't need to beg them or anybody in uh, D.C. or in New York. We can fix this problem. Our leaders have let down. There's no doubt about it. And they know it. When you talk to them, they tell you, we have failed you. And even the president last time apologized. But the problem is they apologize and then they go and repeat the same problem. They go and repeat the same mistake. So they are not learning. Mm. And this is why there is a really a need for us to solve this war and really have, let's transform the kind of leadership we have both within the SPLM and within the government so that our people realize the reason why they made so much sacrifice. Because we are not. We, all we got after our so much sacrifice is more death, more refugee, uh, you know, all the bad names. At least we used to have our dignity. When we used to travel, before even we got our independence, people will, will, will have solidarity with us. You are from South Sudan. Thank they you. know our struggle. But now, after we won and we mess up our independence, we are not having the respect that we used to have. And the only people that can restore our dignity are South Sudanese people, Thank not you. the leaders. The people. Thank you. Right. Well, let's uh, just be closing uh, 30 seconds uh, with you, Professor Naomi Damba. The whole world, uh, the ball is involved in what's called military industrial complex. Uh, these are war machines that are made to kill people. Somebody is making it, somebody is buying. Somebody is getting rich, somebody is getting poorer. The dump site is the continent of Africa. And we must understand that what happened in Southern Sudan affect Kenya, affect Ethiopia, affect the whole ecosystem in Eastern Africa. And therefore, we need to call upon these two people or go to war to stop these two people from mm -hmm. further fighting. Mm -hmm. That is the commitment. It was done in we uh, West Africa with Cote d'Ivoire and the echo wars, it can be done Thank you. in East Africa. Thank you. Right. Ambassador Moincha. Drums of war all over the place, um, wh whether you are talking of the Korean Peninsula, whether you are talking about now Middle East, and uh, it would appear that Iran might resume nuclear enrichment, yeah. whether we are talking about South Sudan. Uh, I don't know whether it's part of prophecy being fulfilled, that, uh, you know, in the times of the end, we'll be seeing this kind of thing. But aside from that sentiment, uh, I think you can see 
when we don't have moral leadership globally, it cascades to local. I think we've lost the direction, the compass, mm -hmm. at the global level, and that is generating. That's why even democracy is receding. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, let's hear from Dr. Mustafa briefly. Yeah, Dibal, this lack of uh, moral leadership uh, is, uh, seems to be infectious. And I, 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 I agree. And again, sympathize with the people of South Sudan. It's only the South Sudanese, and particularly the young people, that are actually going to fix that problem in South Sudan. The countries that are in the region should stop being complicit in the, in the plundering and massacre of the South Sudanese by allowing those who are on sanctions list to move around, as uh, uh, Biara Jack is saying. Um, again, those countries that have interests in South Sudan, if they are not for peace, should desist. And, and just by desisting will actually help South Sudan move forward. Right. Let's hear from uh, Lucy. Um, I, think it, I think it was just this year when uh, the, US, um, the UK announced that they were going to have a minister for loneliness, a whole department or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, loneliness. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Loneliness. I remember. And people laughed. I, I think it was last year. <laughs> yes, and you're still laughing. <laughs> and you know, but the thing is, if a society does not have the people who have the audacity to look at the real picture and acknowledge it, we have a problem. They looked at their society and what was going on and what was harmful to the society. And they said, oh gosh, I think the fact that people are lonely is causing problems. Now, our problem is that we look at symptoms. You know, we look at acts of violence, we look at uh, acts of corruption, you know, we look at the symptoms and begin to address the symptoms. We don't go back and say, mm -hmm. what is causing this issue? Mm -hmm. That's what I am advocating for. And part of the reason is that disconnect, that if mentally I don't see you as a human being that, you know, I can relate to and I can empathize with, you're just a tool Thank you. in my personal perpetuation. So maybe we need a department and a minister of humanization in this country. <laughs> <laughs> we'll first have to have it in South Sudan. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, no, it, on a serious note, uh, you know, it, this thing is very tiring. Yes. This conflict in South Sudan, very costly. And it requires South Sudanese people to stand up, make whatever sacrifice that need to be made to return that dignity and return that peace to our country. And for all of you, our friends in the region, I know you are making a lot of money in this conflict. Some of you are, are, are rich because of this war in South Sudan. But let me tell you what, you can w make even more money when we have peace. Eh? So don't think if we have peace, you will not make the money. Let us have the peace, you will make even more money. Thank you. So don't interrupt our peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.